So welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. So the short answer to that is that we hit 14.1 for the first six months of the year. And we've consistently guided that we are very confident that we'll hit our number this year. And since we are in the quiet period and we haven't made an earnings announcement or earnings warning, the likelihood that the third quarter will be in line with what expectations are very high, as you probably can uh, understand. So uh, our assumption is that we'll make that number. But let me just try to go back and spend five to seven minutes on describing some of the thinking of, of the changes we've done. The fundamental, you know, uh, you know, the starting point is which kind of company do you want to work for? And I have a very basic belief is that good people want to work for good companies. If they're not a good company, they'll leave the company. And I want to work for a good company, and Hinkle was not a good company. So I had two options. Either we changed the company, or I personally left the company. And then it becomes very personal. I did not want to work for a bad company. That was very clear to me. I just didn't want to work for a bad company. When I joined the company, I thought, when I looked upon it, and I knew Paul Pullman, that the CEO of Unilever now, he was running uh, P&G for Europe. He was my largest customer when I was head of... Uh, HP for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. I knew him well because he was my customer, and I just didn't understand why Hinkle's numbers were not any better. The problem was, from 2000 to 2008, Hinkle missed every single number it put out, every single one. So when you go out and say a number is a driver for Hinkle, it was nothing because it was used to, you know, we also missed this number. So there's actually, if you ask in the organization, we had a 12% market target in 2008. You know, 80% of the organization didn't know we had a target. So it was, it was an undriver. The one was go out and be very clear on what are their financial ambitions. And when we communicated that number in London to the financial community in 2008, there was 36 people there and 35 didn't believe it. 35 did not believe us. So sitting in a room like this, communicating, and 35 was just saying it's a you know, waste. We don't understand what you're saying. We don't believe you're going to make it. In 2009, most of the financial community came and said, why not dropping the number? We have the biggest financial crisis since the Second World War. And internally, it was pretty much the same. So the buy-in to the number internally and externally was fairly limited. We then, along with the number, said that, you know, the number was the consequence of three very basic strategic priorities. Full business potential, focusing on our customers, and strength on our global team. And we went in and became very, very disciplined in saying, what do we mean by full business potential? Manufacturing footprint, SG&A cost, number of brands, innovation, shared services, decision matrix. That was one. Focus on our customers meant that we needed to start speaking to our customers. We had never had a customer or CEO of one of our customers at our headquarters. If you were Packard or Compaq, we knew, I knew all of my large customers. We didn't know any of them. So, you know, Bob McDonald or back then A.G. Laffey would go to Bentonville and meet up with Mike Duke at Walmart. We'd never been there. So they had no clue, we, you know, who we were. So we went back and assigned top to tops to each Executive member have a number of customers he or she's uh, responsible for. Every week we go out, we meet customers. Last week I was in Turkey, I met customers. The week before I was in Brazil, I met customers. I'm not going to uh, meet customers today because I'm flying back today, but every week we do that. So now we know all our top customers. And then strengthen our global team, basing on the base belief that unless we have good people, we're not going to make the numbers. And we took our triangle, which you have there, and if you were to ask within our organization today, Every single person knows that triangle, every single one. If you go to the chef in the kitchen, the guy that stands at the gate, if you go to the sales guy in Thailand, they would know the three strategic priorities and the 14%. So for the first time, we've drilled into the organization what that number means. What we also did in order to make certain that uh, we move forward is we terminated 17% of our employees, 13,000 people in three years' time. Our revenue is two and a half billion bigger today and approximately a billion big on profit with 13,000 people less. What it does say is, if you go back to this one, is that we had enormous fat in the organization. Because right now, in this first and the second quarter, we grew approximately 5% with 2% less headcount. So you can see there's a scalability into the organization, not only because we have fat, but in the last number of years, we spent an enormous amount of time investing in standardization, processes, systems, shared services to ensure that you can take the top line and scale through the system and thereby get um, the bottom line out. So we did the three, what I would say, easy. I'm not saying they're easy, but easy. It is easy. It's very easy to close a plant because you write what you want to do. You get somebody to do it. It's very uncomfortable, but it's a very easy thing to do. Somebody here said culture is much more difficult, and that's in the essence. Of course, nobody wanted to do this because it became very unpleasant. Because every time people ask, we said, the target is the target. I don't care what you say, the target is the target. 
And we had a tradition in the past that if we had a bad year, it was oil crisis, it was recession, it was competition, it was you know, sw- you know, flooding in Thailand. But when the year was good, it was because we were fantastic. So we changed around and said, I don't care what the excuse is, it's your number. So when it's good, beauty, you're the hero. If it's not good, you're the not so much hero. But we took, you know, took it out of the system. And we had for ages done adjustments in our comp plans. And we said in 2008, we're not going to change the business plan from 8 to 12. I don't care about recession. So we just kept it, and that's the way it is. We're going to get measured on it. So we kept the business plan, which of course was a stretch because a lot of our people didn't get paid very well during a lot of years. But the point was the company didn't do well. So you can't say I'm a winning, I'm part of a winning organization if you're not winning. And after two years where we've done a lot of you know, really fixing the hardware, as you said, we went back, and a lot of the stuff you've seen here is actually being discussed here at Harvard Business School. So I took the management team here for a week where we went and discussed it. And um, the reason why, uh, when you sp- spoke about culture, and I and actually disagree with a lot of you, I think most companies don't have a culture. I think they have a head count, you know, head- headquarter culture. But when I look upon most companies, when they get a new employee on board, they tell he or she what the job is, what the email account is, how you submit an expense claim, how you get into SAP, and what your batch look like. Very few companies actually sit down and say, here is what we are about. And we wanted to be very, very transparent to whom we wanted to be in the organization. So people could have a choice. I want to be part of that team or I don't want to be part of the team. So we worked with Bob and we had our 10 values and it came out. We had a management team meeting in 2009 at the, at the, you know, the head of the financial crisis. We had $4 million of debt. We were about to lose our, our credit rating one notch down. And we discussed the 10 values. And the people, the management team, the same amount of people, but not the same people, will come to Harvard next summer for a week. We asked, how many of you know the 10 values? And all of us, all of us, were incapable of writing the 10 values correctly on a board. All of us. So I say as a joke, you and I have to change the values of the management team. Um, we choose to change the values. And we worked with Bob on this. And, and one of the things that Bob said, he said, create simplicity in what you say. And I remember one of the words that still says this, so one of my colleagues or myself, it, could, you know, it doesn't really matter, put the word solution in, and Bob said, no, no, solution is complex. You know, Peter, you'll understand solution different to me, and Jose, you'll understand it different to Peter. So we tried to be very specific and very clear on it. Customer, people, financial, sustainability, and family. So be very clear on it so it becomes very easy to remember because the, you know, a lot of the things that stream around simplicity in strategy, in targets, in culture, so people actually understand who we are. And then we drove the culture, I would say, very aggressively into the organization, aggressively in the positive sense of the word. So we had every single employee have been taken through strategy and culture workshop. And what we said is, and I quote now, I said, we don't have Sprite and Coke in our company. We only have Coke, and these are the five values. If you don't like them, get out of here. We're not interested. Because we want people over time that believes in those values. And we think that if you come and say as a leader, I only want three, but I don't want five. Frankly, you are the one who's supposed to live these values in the organization. And if you don't live them, then we don't become transparent and predictable in our organization. And they drive very much back to what I said before. You know, you can only have a winning culture if you win. And basically what we had is that we had a you know, very comfortable, very complacent culture. And everybody, to, to Brian's point, was fulfilling their, you know, their, their, their targets. But the targets were wrong. It was like saying, we're losing every week as a company, and all the employees felt they were winning. And you looked upon, you saw the, you know, the companies you have up here is actually the top, you know, top quartile. So we wanted to measure ourselves against the best ones, and people didn't believe we could make it. We said, we're going to do this. We'll you know, push it through. And if, you don't, if you're not capable of doing it, we'll help you, we'll develop you, or we'll let you go. And Paul sitting up here, who runs our global automated, you know, uh, Auto business. And I remember, you know, conversation. We are we are the biggest adhesive supplier in the world. So all of you, all of you have used our products today. Every single one of you, either on your, you know, iPhone, on your iPad, on your BlackBerry, or on your car, on your running shoe, or the books that have been binded together. So Paul was running one of our problem areas, which was our motor business. And I remember in 2010 we had a conversation, and and the gist was, Paul, you got to fix it, or we'll close it. And he fixed it. We'd never had those conversations before where we sat down. And it was not a threat. It was simply just, this is the basis. If we can't be strong, we shouldn't be there. That's why we closed China for detergents. We sold off you know, our cosmetics business in India and also sold off our detergents business in India. And a lot of people came and said, why did you do this? Our point is, 
it doesn't matter if there's a billion Indians, if we don't make any money on them. You know, there could be three billion. But you've got to be very clear with the size of the organization we have to focus on what you do. And the same comes back to our DRT and our force distribution, which we've done now for the four years now. Every single time we travel, and the management team travels 160 to 107 days a year, every single time we meet with our high potentials. And our high potentials are, if I can take your case study, you go and look upon the grid. S1, T1, T2. So when I went to Brazil, I called the general manager and said, I'd like to have a breakfast meeting with S1, T1, and T2. Very easy. And then we track it every year. And then when we have regretted losses, it has to be one of those. If it's not one of those, then they're not regretted. An M that leaves the company might be quote unquote sad, but it's not a regretted loss. That's why we put this person into M. And then we link the pay scheme to the DRT now. So depending on where you are, then if you are more to the right hand side, you get more. If you're more to the left hand side, you get less. So what we did was we upped it, the overall variable pay, but we redistributed the pay, going back to simplicity. And the thinking is that the best employee you have in your company is the cheapest. Price performance is the lowest. So the best employee you have is actually the cheapest. And the worst is your most expensive one because you pay a lot for very little. So what we said is we're going to re over reward the good ones and quote unquote under reward those who don't perform. And then we went in on exactly the S1, T1 and T2 and said for our best people we'll sell them to Harvard. Everybody can go to Harvard, you just need to be good. Very easy. And we made it completely transparent. In the beginning we thought it would be transparent that the Swazi goes to Harvard or not. We said, no, we don't care. If she is good, which we think she is, that's why she's T1, then she goes to Harvard. Then we over to her to tell her she's good. Very easy. So we then give out plaques, Harvard class of 2011. Everybody knows Paul is at Harvard now. So we've been very, very transparent on this, which has not always been easy, but it's been very important to drive performance into the organization. And as I said, performance is driven by living our values. If you don't live your values, we'll kick you out. It's not a threat. This is who we want to be. If we say we put the customers at the center of what we do and people don't want to see customers or the same with how we engage with our people, how we develop them, how we give them feedback. So for instance, uh, one of the things we did this year in 2012, you know, our feedback was that uh, we're not quick enough to define the targets for our people in the fiscal year. I'm certain some of you have that. When do you actually give the personal target? And then we said, any manager that is not giving the targets out on the deadline will get an M, period. So instead of saying, Cheryl, please do it. I really want you to do this. We just said, the deadline is this. If you don't do it, your rank is M this year. Change overnight. So what we are doing is we are using the grid, you know, very, very, you know, the DRT grid, very specifically on how we look at people. How does the pipeline look? Who do we promote? So for instance, I know we had, in the last three years, we've had 100 people in Harvard. About 50 of those have been promoted. Another 30 has been an international re relocation. So we know exactly how it works. And the pool, by the way, quote unquote, the T1, S1, and T2, is not static. It's every year people get evaluated. So you can be a T1 one year, and if you don't make it, if you're M4 next year, then you're part of the executive resource pool. So that has brought the company tremendously forward. But the point, though, is, as somebody said, that we are in the catch-up mode. So hitting the 14% is good, but it's not good enough. So, of course, on the 16th of November this year, we'll... You know, we will communicate our new strategy to the financial market and also our new financial targets. And what I'm saying here is not a disclosure of anything, but it's very clear that the financial targets for the next four years will be more challenging for the, than for the past four years. But just going back in 2008, nobody believed it. Of the top 200 leaders, 100 left on the management board. Of the six we're in the board, one guy and myself is left in 2008. So it was not like it was a all easy. You get the very easy part right now here because it's and it's very easy and you can see I'm in a good mood because the company is doing well. <laughs> but, but but the point though is when you're on a four year journey, there are so many curveballs that come in and and maybe in closing, what we use as a terminology was we said, you know, we're starting in Hamburg and we know we're gonna go to New York and we know where New York is, but depending on the weather we'll stick out the right course, but we know we're going to get to New York. And New York was the 14%. And that's pretty much how we looked upon it. Conceptually, that we know we have the potential. Do we know all the answers? Of course, we don't. But we have four years of thinking time. And if the organization, including the management team, are not capable of developing new ideas and initiative over four years, you have a very different problem. So I think it's immensely important in closing 
that a company is very clear on where it wants to go, you know, not only numbers-wise, but strategy-wise, that everybody knows what strategy is. They're very clear on what is the values of the company, and they live them, so we say they're important. Then, you know, then we live the values. If not, we shouldn't be living them. And we also spend a lot of time, and I mean enormous amount of time, on people development and getting the right atmosphere in the company and developing the right set of leaders moving forward. That was the short version.